here. We are still waiting for one panelist, so we are going to be uh, starting briefly. Thank you so much for your punctuality. We could, you know, she may get called up, and so if we want to keep the time, and also since it's been live streamed, we could start with Lisa, which we're going to do anyway, and just go to Walter and then bring Walter in when she comes in. As long as she's not so Lisa, can just go. you can accommodate. I think you need to do that. So, I think okay, so. let's yeah. start then. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this uh, COP28 side event. How can international ocean law assist states to meet their climate change obligations? It is an honor for AIDA to moderate this panel, organized with our partners, Rogers University, the High Seas Alliance, and IUCN. My name is Javier Davalos Gonzalez, Climate Program Coordinator at AIDA, the Inter-American Association for Environmental Defense, and I will be the moderator for this session. The high seas, the area beyond countries' national waters, is the largest habitat on Earth and home to millions of species. Currently, just over 1% is protected by a fragmented and uncoordinated governance framework. However, the new high seas treaty represents a radical opportunity to increase this figure and enable a more holistic and equitable management for human activities. The ratification and implementation of the High Seas Treaty, a completely new governance framework for the conservation and sustainable use of ocean, require collaboration among nations. We are at a pivotal moment as international bodies have created an opportunity to change the ocean's fate. And a ratification of the treaty is expected to be happening in 2025. The treaty will not only take us closer to achieving the third, uh, third commitment, but to also ensure a healthy and resilient ocean for all. Finally, for this session, it's important that the three advisory opinions anticipated from the three international courts, ICJ, uh, ITLOS, and the Inter-American Court on Human Rights, can assist the states to better understand and fulfill their human rights obligation while protecting ocean biodiversity and its capacity to mitigate and adapt to climate change and of course, secure peaceful multilateral outcomes and delivering on obligations to the Paris Agreement. With this, I want to introduce uh, our panel of experts with interventions uh, in, the in the following order. Lisa, Levin will be uh, speaking about how the global ocean is important to climate mitigation and adaptation. We're waiting for uh, Nulifer Oral. Uh, when she comes, she will speak about climate change and the protection of the ocean, what is needed. Uh, we're having here Walter Schult from the Ecuador uh, delegation, who's going to do an intervention on the BBNG uh, J agreement uh, and the four key elements for the package. Uh, we are also welcoming Simi Payne, who is going to speak about the advisory opinions in international courts um, and other aspects related to ecosystem resilience and adaptation. And finally, uh, Rebecca Hubbard, who is going to be uh, talking about the need for the urgent ratification of the High Seas Biodiversity Treaty and the Paris Agreement uh, relation. Uh, now I'm going to give the floor uh, to
to Lisa Levin. I'm sorry, I'm switching the presentations while I'm moderating, so it's kind of complicated. Yeah. The what? I need to advance the slides. Oh. Thank you. There you go. Okay. So, hi so Lisa Levin, uh, a distinguished professor emerita at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, UC San Diego, is a deep sea biolog biologist and co founder of the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative. She also represents the Deep Ocean Observing Strategy to the Decade for Ocean Science. Dr. Levin is active in bringing climate science to policy and has contributed to multi multiple IPCC reports, UNFCCC Ocean Dialogues, World Ocean Assessments, the BBNG uh, Agreement, and uh, International Seabed Authority negotiations. So, uh, Lisa, welcome. You have the floor. Okay, thank you. So, um, I'm actually going to talk about the ocean and its biodiversity and their roles in the climate system. And um, by inference, how important they are for mitigation and adaptation. But I'm, I, I'm the scientist in the room, <laughs> the, the science for the panel. And I'm going to start at the beginning with some really important facts that matter for governance. So um, first, I think we all know there's only one ocean on this planet. It's all interconnected. It covers two thirds of the planet. Most of it is deep ocean, that is below 200 meters. And about two thirds of the ocean is beyond national jurisdiction. That deep ocean represents 95% of the habitable volume on this planet. So I will be in this session referring mainly to the high seas and the deep seas, which include 75% of exclusive economic zones. The coastal zone is really important for climate. I won't be talking about blue carbon ecosystems like seagrass and mangroves today. I'm going to stick to the open ocean. We know this ocean is our greatest climate mitigator, and I'm sure you've all seen this number many, many times. It takes up about 93% of the excess heat out of the atmosphere. And I heard some enormous number yesterday about what the temperature would be if we didn't have an ocean. And I think, I forget if it was 50 degrees higher than we are now or if it was 50 degrees centigrade. But at any rate, it's, it's a huge number. And we really rely on our ocean for this planet to be livable. That heat uptake is not without consequence. It's led to more stratification layering, lower gas solubility, loss of oxygen, and declines in primary production. The other big uptake from the ocean is carbon dioxide. And again, almost all of you have seen these numbers, 25 to 30% of the excess CO2 in the atmosphere is taken up by the ocean. Again, not without consequence. It's lowering the pH and causing ocean acidification. And all of these happen at the ocean surface, but they do not stay there. We have this thing called the Great Conveyor Belt. Thermohaline circulation transports surface waters to great depths, and so we now have a deep ocean that's um, experiencing declines uh, and projected to experience declines in food, loss of oxygen, loss of pH, and rise in temperature. So the ocean is changing with climate change, and there are major consequences for open ocean ecosystems. Warming is causing redistribution of species. This is actually probably quite important for governance. Oxygen loss is causing biodiversity loss, compression of animal habitats and changes in food webs, and ocean acidification is making it hard for our deep water corals and other calcifying organisms to survive. So the biodiversity of the oceans actually under threat from climate change and protecting and addressing climate change will protect the biodiversity in the ocean. I think that's a very important point. But now I want to talk about the roles of that biodiversity in the carbon cycle. And probably most of you have heard of the biological pump. This is a process that removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and puts it into the deep ocean. 
It starts with phytoplankton at the surface, photosynthesizing and taking up carbon in, from the surface ocean, which is entered from the atmosphere. And the, the phytoplankton die, aggregate, and sink, or else they're eaten by other small organisms that themselves might um, sink, or in many cases, they'll migrate vertically by the billions, down 1,400 to 1,000 meters a day, bringing carbon into the deep ocean where it remains sequestered. But it's not just the tiny organisms that are important. We have the fish and marine mammals um, and jellyfish, other big animals contributing to carbon transport and storage in the ocean. We have animals, I mentioned the migrators, not just the small plankton, but the whales even migrate down and sometimes fall to the bottom, uh, bringing car massive amounts of carbon in the form of carcasses. They migrate across ocean basins. We have transfer of carbon through the food web. Um, we have animals doing mixing. There, there are all sorts, and I should say all of the fish and, and uh, whales store a large amount of carbon in their bodies. So they play a really important role bringing carbon into the deep sea ultimately. And you see a diagram like this. This is how the deep oceans typically presented, a flat line with no features. But in fact, we know the deep ocean is full of amazing array of ecosystems. And all of the species in these ecosystems also provide really important carbon cycle services. I talked about the vertical transport by the water column organisms already, but the uh, ecosystems on the continental margin sequester massive amounts of carbon, our low oxygen zones, our canyons and fjords, and our cold water coral reefs. We have vast uh, nodule zones, abyssal plains that sequester a low carbon per unit area, but because they are so huge, they sequester 75% of the ocean floor carbon. Uh, we have uh, dense aggregations of animals on tens of thousands of seamounts that sequester carbon in their bodies. We have thousands of methane seeps along our margin where the microbes and the animals remove methane coming out from the seafloor and preventing it from getting into the atmosphere. They turn it into rock, they turn it into tissue, and we have hydrothermal vents that are fertilizing the ocean and allowing the, uh, with iron and allowing the primary productivity that we all rely on for our fisheries. So there are an amazing array of services provided by biodiversity in the open ocean and deep ocean. And it's been estimated that about half a billion tons of carbon are captured and stored in the high seas annually. This is has an estimated value of about $150 billion, one could argue with the amounts. But at any rate, protecting this biodiversity will help maintain the carbon cycle and the Earth's climate. But this biodiversity is also highly vulnerable to direct human disturbances, and I've listed there on the, the left side some of the many different types of human activities which uh, have the potential to emit carbon as they're conducted, to remove carbon stores from the ocean, to interfere with carbon transfer, or to release sequestered carbon from the seabed. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to run through the list due to time, but I think you're all familiar with um, most of these. But I would like to draw attention to the last one, marine carbon dioxide removal technologies. Um, there are many proposed, and we've heard a lot about them at this COP. Uh, there are six or eight different technologies, all, all of which involve putting carbon into the bottom of the ocean as a way to sequester excess carbon, um, often use stimulating or using the natural um, processes that I've just been talking about. And this QR code goes to a paper that talks about the risks uh, introduced to, uh, to deep sea ecosystems by these different technologies. And there hasn't been much discussion at the COP about these risks, but it's, I think uh, it's important to think about these as we consider and test and, and begin to deploy these different technologies. And, uh, and uh, this is, I think, my last slide. I, I think it's worth pointing out some of the interesting features of the deep sea and high seas ecosystems that might create challenges for us. 
most people don't realize that deep sea organisms can live a very long time. The fish for hundreds of years, the corals and sponges for thousands of years. So, so much longer than a human lifespan. The ecosystems are really heterogeneous, so a small area might include different types of ecosystems with different types of species. So you can't manage, uh, you know, aerially for one ecosystem only. The species have really strong mutualistic interactions. That means they depend on each other. And the deep sea and high seas ecosystems are highly connected through animals, carbon, water, and energy. They're connected from the seafloor all the way up to the surface, but they're also connected across ocean basins. They're acro connected across jurisdictions from, you know, beyond national jurisdiction to EEZs. And they're even connected with land in many cases, the seabirds that in the high seas actually poop on land and fertilize the plants and allow carbon uptake there. So there's these huge connections that I think are really important. And with that, I will stop the lecture and, and uh, pass it on the baton now. So. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Lisa. Thank you so much. I am going to switch now to Nulifer Oral. Um, she's the director of the Center for International Law, uh, National University of Singapore, chair of the 74th session of the UN International Law Commission and co-chair of the ILC study group on sea level rise. Uh, welcome, Nulifer. Uh, she's going to share with us about the International Ocean Law and how Bibi and Jay sits in that. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this invitation um, and, um, and particularly to my dear friend, Simi. And it's wonderful to um, follow someone who I admire ex very much and has contributed greatly to ocean science, uh, Lisa Levin, your professor, really. And I have to say that um, this is one area where the science is absolutely fundamental um, to the work um, that um, we, the lawyers, have to do as well. We do not understand the science. We cannot promote and advance conservation of, um, of biological diversity uh, everywhere, but particularly including in the ocean. So, well, we celebrate, of course, uh, a great um, achievement, and that is the adoption of the BBNJ agreement, or does everyone know what BBNJ is? <laughs> it's, it's the legally binding uh, multilateral convention for the conservation and sustainable development of biological diversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction, which is why we say BBNJ amongst us, or now high seas and biological diversity treaty. Um, and there's two aspects what I'm focused on, because areas beyond national jurisdiction means this is the area where no coastal state exercises legal jurisdiction. The only jurisdiction would be shipping, and that's very limited. Um, so it's absolutely important that um, states, um, after many, many years, and in fact, if you listen to the dear Sylvia Earle, decades, and perhaps Lisa as well, that the idea of protecting, uh, having protected areas in the high seas, um, wild sea, wild ocean, uh, ocean reserves, um, was something that dated back to the 1970s, but, I'm, but in 2023, um, uh, the BBNJ agreement, after many years of negotiation, uh, was adopted by consensus. And this is absolutely critical. Um, yeah, there are a few abstentions, but the consensus is, is what is important, meaning that um, states are on board. We have over 80 signatures now. Now the pathway is to rapid ratification because this was the missing link in our ocean governance. The Law of the Sea Convention, we call the Constitution for the Ocean, um, adopted in 1982, negotiated in the 1970s, but I can assure you, in the 21st century, it remains really as probably one of the best international agreements for conservation, for protection of the marine environment and the ocean. However, 
um, the high seas, even though that protection, the duty to protect and preserve the marine environment applies to the high seas or areas beyond national jurisdiction, there was not a method, a framework for implementing that. As I said, coastal states don't have um, uh, that, um, uh, the competence. So states now, in a very sophisticated agreement, I would say, um, have been given important tools to um, take the measures, including area-based management tools, um, to protect. But also, very important, because we're at COP28, also includes climate change. And it's the first international legally bonding agreement that includes the ocean and climate change, because I don't count um, UNFCCC and Paris Agreement. They are not binding. The language is soft language, and it limits the ocean to this function of a, of a carbon sink. Um, BB&J is now incorporated at climate change as well, and we need to protect the high seas. Um, for, as, as um, Professor Levin has so uh, um, clearly explained, it is the, the ocean is critical for um, the climate system, and also, the marine environment is absolutely critical for the livelihoods of millions, if not billions, of people. So the high seas, um, uh, high seas of biological uh, biodiversity treaty is an important, very critical uh, instrument that filled a gap and that will have application for climate change as well. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Now, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Walter Schult, uh, his chief negotiator at the Ecuador delegation for COP28, a uh, diplomat with 26 years of experience, serves as uh, director of environmental and sustainable development, also at the permanent missions to the United Nations in New York and Geneva. Uh, acting for more than 10 years as chief negotiator in different multilateral processes on sustainable development, climate change, biodiversity, oceans. He's currently an alternate member in the GCF board, and he has acted as vice president of the Bureau of the UNFCCC Conference of the Parts between uh, 2015 and 2017 and as a chair of the group of the 77 for climate change in 2017. Uh, Walter, welcome. Uh, and since you have been participating in both the BBNG and the climate change negotiations, um, we would like to listen to the key elements and provisions or mechanisms of the BBNG agreement uh, that can contribute to the achievement of the climate uh, goals. Welcome, Walter. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Javier. Um, always, always a pleasure to, to talk to after uh, scientists. We, we feel uh, that all governments, really all governments, but particularly the most powerful, should should always listen to, to science, and, and, and maybe they will feel humble as they should be in terms of when they have to to to, to reach agreements and make decisions at, uh, at global level and, of course, at national level as well. So, thank you for those uh, for that <laughs> great presentations that remind us where, where is the right direction. Um, to the, the, before going perhaps to the BBNJ text, uh, just a little bit of context on the, on the UNCCC text, because we have the 92 convention which uh, recognized as the, in the climate regime as um, an integral part, and, and that includes, uh, of course, uh, the atmosphere uh, as, as a whole, uh, but also atmosphere, biosphere, geosphere, and their interactions. However, the same convention defines climate change as the change of climate change, which is attributed directly or indirectly to human activity that alters the composition of the global atmosphere, and then goes on. So it, the convention itself, uh, even though it recognizes the, the larger definition of the climate system, when it talks about uh, climate change, it already excludes somehow uh, the rest of the components of, uh, of that uh, climate system. Uh, since then, as you all know, or, or I don't know if it's coincidence or not, but climate change, uh, no, ocean has been left out, although it's marginalized from the climate 
regime, and uh, we have to wait until pretty much the recent years. Uh, formation of the, of course, the IPCC contribution uh, with the report on cryosphere and, and oceans, uh, and the group of countries, of course, civil society scientists, bringing side events on oceans and, and the, um, the integration of a group of friends of the oceans and so on, until we got in Glasgow the mandate for the dialogue that has been a great contribution uh, to, to build and, and which calls specifically to the programs and, and constituted bodies under the UFGPC to consider how to integrate and strengthen ocean-based uh, action in their system mandates. So at least we have that already beginning and with specific mandates in the uh, UNFGPC regimes. On the, UN, on the BBNJ process, um, it was not that strong, but uh, emerging and growing little by little uh, throughout those 20, almost 20 years of, of debate and four of negotiations, the, the linkage with, with climate change, but still mostly limited to, to, to the impacts of climate change and ocean desertification um, on the oceans. Those impacts, of course, are not limited, but they, they address uh, or refer to sea level rise, coral bleaching, no certification, at worst, uh, toxic uh, algae events, uh, among others, and of course, impacts on the reduction on, on loss in biodiversity. Um, but again, it was they were somehow limited to two parts of the of the agreement, and uh, I will refer, of course, to, to those two, uh, which is uh, the. What, one of the key components uh, of streams of the BBNJ agreement, which is uh, area-based protection uh, MPAs, including MPAs, area-based management tools, including MPAs, and of course, uh, environmental impact assessment. The preamble, nevertheless, talks already or recognize uh, the need to address uh, interalia, among other impacts, uh, climate change, ozonification, pollution, including plastic pollution, uh, and sustainable use, and sustainable use. Uh, we have also a reference in the definition sec section uh, about uh, cumulative, cumulative impacts. And then we have a very strong and, and uh, important, clear, uh, unequivocal reference to the cumulative impacts uh, as a consequence of climate change uh, and also the acidification and related impacts. So we have already a very clear uh, um, reference there. And in Article 7 on the principles and approaches also uh, includes a, a, a sort of endorsement of an ecosystem approach and a, a, to an approach that builds ecosystem resilience to the adverse effects of climate change and ocean identification. Um, going specifically to the ABMT MPA, area-based management tools, and, and by including marine protected areas, uh, we have a very clear also reference, uh, a provision on Article 17, which among the objectives of uh, that section of that uh, measures, uh, includes the um, objective to protect, preserve, restore, and maintain biological diversity and ecosystems, including with a view to enhance their productivity and health and strengthen resilience to stressors, including those related to climate change and ocean education. So we have there as well. Uh, same goes for Article 19 on proposals, which uh, requires with, for establishing an area, uh, the identification of the basis uh, on uh, scientific information, the preconditional approach and ecosystem approach as well. Uh, the other side of the coin of that uh, is that fisheries are excluded, uh, as you know, from, from that uh, area, from, from, from the scope of the ABMT APA uh, uh, section of the, of the BBNJ agreement, and we know that fisheries are also a stress stressor that uh, contributes, uh, combined with climate change, to, to some of um, the ocean identification, coral bleaching, and so on. Um, the open door that we have is that there is a process to uh, review uh, the, in, in, with the concept of ad adaptive management, to review the established uh, MPAs uh, or ABMTs, uh, which will provide to adapt or adjust those areas in accordance to science to see where we are in terms of, the, of those impacts. Um, the other big area is, as I said, AEAs, environmental impact uh, assessments, um, which also from, uh, in my view, contribute or opens a very important uh, doors uh, or hooks towards measures related to climate change. Uh, of course, countries are uh, called to identify where an activity that is planned needs to go through an, to an environmental impact assessment. There is no specific references to climate change there, 
But uh, among the thresholds uh, for conducting an AA, there is uh, in Italia, the initial analysis of potential impacts, including consideration of cumulative uh, impacts. And then as we go to the other provision, uh, at the beginning, we have climate change and ocean identification. Um, there is all this process to determine the different uh, um, layers of when to conduct or not an AEA, but we have uh, already also a mandate for the uh, SBT, so the scientific body, to determine <coughs> what are the activities that uh, should be included uh, in, in this type of uh, analysis or uh, assessments. Um, one example of that, and that will, that will depend on the entry into force and the work of the uh, scientific and uh, technical body, is marine geoengineering. So I'm very glad that it was mentioned because um, we have there a, an issue that, at least for my country, has, was, has been on, on a, a, as a matter of concern for, for many years, I, I would say even, even almost two decades, is ocean fertilization um, uh, exercise experiments that were conducted in the high seas, but with a strong influence to the, um, our jurisdictional waters, particularly in the Galapagos, uh, mar towards the Galapagos Marine Reserve, where we had to mobilize uh, not only, of course, all our, our, our voices, but uh, the South Eastern Pacific, uh, the Commission, uh, even uh, provisions or, or calls and direct contacts with the uh, Craig, uh, Craig Venter, a enterprise that was conducted the, conducting the, um, the exercise to, the, to really try to see how the London uh, Convention and Protocol could be uh, enforced uh, towards these type of activities without a, a really a precautionary approach. Um, since then, at that time, it was, we were successful to stop <laughs> the, the, the second round of the experiments, but since then, we know that a lot of new initiatives, technologies, have been developed, and, and we know what we think that the AEA will provide that, that among others, other, this, this important tool to, to, to address. Um, so, inclusion, perhaps being a, a, um, a pathological optimism, because otherwise, how can you come to keep continue coming to, <laughs> to COPS uh, after many years? Uh, is that we, we think that the entry into force, the urgent entry force, is so much needed that the, it doesn't provide all the tools, all the measures, and obligations to address uh, climate change through the BBNJ agreement and all the other way around, but at least it provides some entry points, uh, measures that will be developed in terms of the AAAs and the MPAs um, that will be very, very useful uh, to respond to that nexus that science has demonstrated that is undeniable and we need to, to, to address it if we want to be serious about um, addressing the, the threat of climate change. Thank you very much. Thanks, Walter. Uh, thank you very much, um, and uh, your, your interventions are going to allow us to have a Q&A session uh, afterwards, so thank you for the three panelists so far to, to uh, don't pass the seven minute limit. Uh, you're making my job very easy. Uh, now I want to introduce Simi Bain. Uh, it's a member of the Rogers University faculty where she teaches international and environmental law. She's a chair of the Ocean Law Specialist Group of the International Union for Conservation of Nature, World Commission on Environmental Law. Uh, Professor Payne served as counsel on behalf of the IUCN before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea in its uh, current climate change case and in, in its previous deep seabed, seabed mining and fisheries advisory opinion cases. So uh, welcome, Simi, and uh, we want to listen from you about, of course, this advisory opinion processes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Javier. And uh, it's been my pleasure to organize this session on behalf of Rutgers University with our partners, AIDA and the High Seas Alliance, um, and really appreciate all of you coming together today to talk about these issues. I want to go even deeper into international law, and so my task today is to share with you the exciting and very significant work going on in the international courts. And what you see in this, uh, these pictures are the judges of the three courts that um, we'll be talking about. So, you know, 
the, with the IPCC predicting that the planet's on track to exceed 1.5, some states decided that it was potentially valuable to turn to the international courts um, as almost a last resort to try to get binding obligations to actually do something about this crucial problem. So in the past year, we've had three requests for advisory opinions submitted to international courts asking them to interpret the climate change obligations that governments have acknowledged under treaties to which they are parties. The international courts and tribunals are normally used to settle disputes between governments. But these three courts can also provide advisory opinions that provide the court's interpretation of a legal question. They aren't legally binding, but they guide states with this authoritative interpretation from the judges who will decide contentious cases in the future, should there be any, um, so that the states know how to implement their treaty obligations. So this makes a, the advisory opinions a really important tool to build both capacity and compliance with treaties and with international law in general. The classic analysis of why states don't comply with their treaty obligations by chase and chase is that states generally intend to, but often don't know what they need to do or lack the capacity to fulfill their obligations. So again, you can see where the advisory opinions can help guide states' parties' behavior. <laughs> the procedure for an advisory opinion is that the question, a legal question, will be submitted to the international court, then usually other members of the treaties at issue will be invited to submit their views in writing and in oral hearings. And those statements with these three courts will be either are or will be publicly available on the internet, so you can go look at them. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which is the court with the, uh, in the lower, lower right of the slide uh, with all the flags behind the judges, it has jurisdiction under the American Convention on Human Rights. There are 20 parties in the American hemisphere, and Chile and Colombia requested the advisory opinion on climate change obligations from this influential court. Their submissions are due December 18th, the week from today. So um, you can keep an eye out for those appearing eventually on the website. Um, note also that there is a contentious case in the European Court of Human Rights. The most advanced in the process, I, oh, I think, uh, I, did I skip over the ICJ? The International Court of Justice, the World Court, is the court in the upper right corner. Um, Vanuatu led a request that, uh, that was submitted to the court by the UN General Assembly. Their written submissions aren't due to the court until January. And the uh, Law of the Sea Tribunal, as I said, is most advanced in this process. So the Law of the Sea Tribunal um, received a request from the Commission of Small Island States. And I have to note that uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Nilifer Aral was a member of the COSIS legal team. And they asked these questions. So <coughs> what are the specific obligations of state parties to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea to prevent, reduce, and control pollution of the marine environment, and to protect and preserve the marine environment in relation to climate change impacts, including ocean warming and sea level rise and ocean acidification. Now, those of you who go to sleep with the Law of the Sea Convention under your pillow will recognize some of this language. Um, so what, what will the court say? We'll see. We don't know. We won't know what the court has to say. We're get, hoping to see the advisory opinion in March, <coughs> so that's pretty soon. Um, but in the meantime, if you're having trouble falling asleep so that you can sleep on top of the convention, um, you can go to the website, itlos.org, and you can find the submissions from over 30 states 
nine international organizations, including IUCN, and 10 non-governmental organizations. And you can also watch the oral statements, which is great streaming and completely free. You don't have to buy Netflix to watch it. Um, so we expect, I expect, I should say, it's, this is my crystal ball, okay? Looking at the convergence of views in those statements. That's a, for the last few minutes, but Javier gives me the hook. Um, I wanna touch on some of the places that there is convergence and also where the BB&J agreement was referenced, even though it isn't entered into force, it hasn't even been ratified by a single state yet. We, I expect that the tribunal will affirm that 1.5, not two degrees, is the maximum, and that it is extremely likely to say that even 1.5 is too warm for many marine ecosystems. And I have got to tell you, that may seem obvious if you've spent the last two weeks here, but it was not obvious back early last year when these statements were being written and when, you know, actually having states say that this is their view <coughs> is really significant. Another key point that was not obvious that would be the case, but I can't believe that the tribunal would decide anything other than this, is that even terrestrial em emissions of greenhouse gases will be subject to the Law of the Sea Convention. Um, a key question that I hope will be addressed is how obligations under the convention are additional to those required by the climate change regime. Many states referenced the Paris Agreement. So understanding how the tribunal sees the Law of the Sea Convention and the Paris Agreement working together will be very interesting. So some of the things that states said about the BB&J Agreement. Um, Egypt said that the BB&J Agreement is useful for further clarifying the obligations of states with respect to the protection and preservation of the marine environment with reference to climate change. Coast itself took this view. New Zealand described it as states have given effect to the obligation to cooperate, which you see often through the Law of the Sea Convention, most recently in the elaboration of the text of the BB&J Agreement. The African Union also made a similar reference. Um, several states referred to relevant principles that would govern climate change obligations under the law of the Sikh Convention that they set, point out are found in the BB&J Agreement, notably ecosystem resilience, precaution. And for the environmental impact assessment, the European Union, France, IUCN, uh, this is a quote from the EU's submission, once it is entered into force, the BB&J Agreement will further implement and strengthen the EIA obligation laid down in Article 206 of the UN Convention. New Zealand referred to uh, Ambassador Schultz's uh, point that cumulative impacts is included and said that the BB&J's definition of cumulative impacts and the obligation to ensure cumulative impacts are assessed and evaluated when an environmental impact assessment is conducted under that agreement is relevant to interpretation of the convention. The EU observed that strategic environmental assessment, an important planning tool for conservation and sustainability, and to address the many activities that Dr. Levin referred to, is implied by the convention and that the BBNJ Article 27 confirms that interpretation. So you can see from this that the BB&J agreement is already being considered relevant to the interpretation of the international law governing climate change. And I invite you to look at what the states have said in their submissions to the courts while we wait and then to look carefully at what the courts say because that will be important guidance. And I apologize, I have two slides with uh, QR codes that you can snap if you want to get. This is 
a new piece of work that IUCN has produced explaining in sort of less legal terms uh, the BB&J agreement. And the second slide, this is the Rutgers Climate and Energy Institute that, who were so helpful in bringing this whole session to you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Simi. We're moving forward to our last panelist. Um, I want to welcome Rebecca Hubbard. She's the director of the High Seas Alliance, a global alliance for more than 50 NGOs and the IUCN working to protect high seas. Rebecca has an honors degree in the environmental science and has been campaigning for over 20 years from the local to international level primarily to better protect and manage the ocean. Rebecca is going to uh, share with us about the need for urgent ratification on, on the high seas treaty. Welcome, Rebecca. Thanks, Javier. And uh, yes, it's my extreme honor to be on this very esteemed panel. I feel that my honors degree in environmental science is perhaps not quite up to standard with these experts, but I do have the extreme pleasure of uh, representing an incredibly um, impressive alliance of NGOs and civil society from around the world and uh, our work to build on the science and the legal um, aspects that we've been talking about here is I think incredibly important. So the main point that I have to make is around the, um, the need to race towards ratification of the BBNJ Treaty. We've heard uh, from the other speakers about some of the content of the High Seas Treaty and how it will help, it gives us the legal framework to protect uh, marine ecosystems and marine life in the high seas and how that relates to the incredibly essential services of the ocean to protect us from the worst of climate change uh, and its incredibly important role in climate mitigation. And it's really, it is the High Seas Treaty, it is the only law that we have that gives us that legal framework to protect the high seas. Um, and despite the fact that it's taken 20 years to get to this stage, to get this treaty, um, really the work starts now. <laughs> I hate to say that because everyone's tired, but, um, you know, just drawing a, a parallel with the Paris Agreement, it took a very long time to get to the point of getting the Paris Agreement as well. And, you know, to get 60, at least 60 countries to ratify the treaty is a big job, but we need to do that in a year and a half. We need to get that done by 2025, by the next UN Ocean Conference, so that the treaty can enter into force and so that we can start actually protecting life in the high seas and actually managing against some of these very potentially risky uh, artificial geoengineering activities in the high seas. And it's possible. The Paris Agreement was uh, ratified widely and entered into force in around a year since it was brought into, um, since it was adopted. So it's absolutely possible and I think that the amount of enthusiasm that we've already seen, the, cele the let's face it, the global celebration when we achieved adoption of the treaty unanimously was really, I think, reflective of the hope and the support and the political will behind the treaty. We've got 84 signatures already. And I think the one of the things that I want to highlight is that even though no country has yet ratified, because ratification does take time, back in capitals, people have to prepare bills, they have to get parliamentary support. Um, already by signing the treaty, countries are committing to not do anything that undermines the objectives of the treaty. So they are already essentially committing to implement the treaty. Even though it hasn't entered into international law yet, there is such a thing um, 
as provisional application, which means that a country can already start acting as though it is in effect. And that's something that we're really calling on countries to do um, because obviously we need action to start now. We don't really want to wait a another moment. And as well, obviously that will have, and as we've heard, benefits for, for climate action and climate mitigation as well. There's a number of things that need to be established, like the scientific and technical body, um, other committees, that will be crucial for the treaty to be able to function once it enters into force. So it's, it's critical that, that countries also start to look at that. Um, did that work? No, there. And um, just in terms of preparing for implementation along that line, countries in line with the um, concept of um, provisional application and in line with the concept of a commitment to the treaty's objectives, countries can already start work on um, proposing or preparing the data that we need to propose high seas marine protected areas. They can start working together. They can start bringing together the science and the research for that. They can start collaborating with other states. They can put into their nationally determined contributions, their next, next national action plans, intention to ratify the treaty and implement the treaty. These are direct, as we've heard, actions that will contribute to addressing or delivering on our climate mitigation and adaptation um, requirements. So I just would like to finish by saying that the High Seas Alliance is, as I said, um, a global network. We have partners in many countries around the world and we're absolutely committed to supporting countries in all regions to ratify and prepare for implementation. And we think that it's incredibly important that this is an equitable uh, process and that we, to ensure that we have effective implementation. We can't just have all of Europe signing and ratifying. We need large numbers of countries in Asia, Africa, the Pacific, the Middle East to ratify and to build that capacity. And we are taking our beautiful Octavia, the octopus, to various high-level events over the next year and a half to continue to raise motivation and momentum uh, for states to, to ratify. And we stand ready to help you in any way that is needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to, to the panelists. Uh, it's been a uh, very uh, important way to uh, address the importance of the high seas treaties and the related processes also for climate action in this hopefully last day of negotiations in the COP28. Um, and now I want to open the floor for the uh, public and see if you have any questions or comments. Yeah, I see one over there. I don't know if you need a, a mic. Yeah, thank you so much. It's because of the, the transmission. Welcome, thank you. Simon Wormsley, WWF UK. I, I just want to ask the panel, EBSAs, no one mentioned EBSAs. I, I just like to hear what the panel would say about how we can use the information, data, the agreement on EBSA descriptions in terms of bringing this climate ocean nexus convergence together better. Bearing in mind, we already have an EBSA that's described on aragonite saturation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, whoever wants to address. <laughs> yes, OK. I, there's, I actually am going to equivocate a little bit because um, I haven't been deeply involved in the EBSIC conversation, but um, ecologically and biologically significant areas. What we, here, here's what I can share of what I've learned. And partly, I'd like to point out through the process of the negotiations is where I learned about EBSIS first because side events at the BB&J negotiation brought in scientists working on EBSAs 
um, Dr. Levin, many other scientists who explained to the observers and negotiators what the science had to tell us. So, the, Eb says what, what we were told back in, then is, we're not saying these should be marine protected areas, they're just really valuable places. And so we do have this beautifully laid out um, sort of maps, if you just go online and take a look, you can see that all over the world, there are places that have already been identified as particularly valuable and important. As we start moving forward, as Meg said, towards you know, planning where we want to place marine protected areas or area-based management tools, this is a reference that we can use. It's a kind of a wish list. It might not be the exclusive wish list. There may be others that should be included, especially with the rapidly evolving environment that Dr. Levin has described with so many factors changing the marine environment we're gonna to need to stay on top of what continues to be ecologically and biologically significant. So. Can I add just a little bit? Yeah. Please. Okay, I, I think the EBSAs are a great starting point. I mean, if we want to achieve 30 by 30, we'll have to have large protected areas in, you know, in the international ocean. But the EBSAs, and, and they, they represent a huge amount of work. I don't know if people know how they were done. They had regional meetings with scientists and all different kinds of people trying to identify what's important in each region of the ocean. But they don't address climate change and the fact that the ecosystems are changing. I believe there's one out of, I don't know, several hundred EBSAs, I'm not sure how many there are. There's one that identify ocean acidification as a problem and identify a, a coral reef refugia type environment. That's my understanding. But the rest of them don't. And so that's why I'm saying it's a starting point. We need to look at what the ocean will look like in 30, 20 years, 30 years, 100 years in designing our protected areas, not just what it looks like right now or looked like mm. last year when somebody visited. So that's all I want to add. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is there another question from the audience? Okay, I'm seeing three. One, two, three, four. Uh, and if, if you can please uh, name the person who you are addressing the question, that will be very good in terms of time. Maybe and take all the and uh, yes, wonderful. Let's take all four questions, uh, and and then you can go ahead and answer. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, my name is Gita. I'm a law student at the University of Maine School of Law in the U.S. Um, I was wondering for Simi, um if about the environmental impact statements or uh, that would be required by BNNG, uh, would they? be resemble the US EIS framework or and generally have the effects of domestic EISs influenced the expectation of this requirement? Mm -hmm. The second question? Here in the front. Okay then Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for your time. This has been great. Um, my name is Vasco Chavez Molina. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Colorado Boulder. I guess this is a two-part question. Um, as someone who's not an expert in BBNJ, I'm a little bit interested in understanding what the decision-making process looks like for the creation of marine protected areas in the high seas. So is this going to be consensus decision-making, two-thirds majority? Um, and then what is going to be the role of regional fishery management organizations under BBNJ and the enforcement mechanisms that have to be in place? Thank you. We have another question here in the front, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Catherine Chabot, and I'm from the, the European Parliament, and I will have to, I will be the rapporteur for the ratification of BBNJ. So I hope we will uh, ratify this, uh, the, the treaty 
at EU level before the end of our mandate in six months, so it's a race, as you said. Uh, a comment before, I will be very short, but I have two, two, two questions. A first comment, because Earlier, I was uh, the co-founder of the Ocean and Climate Platform. I organized a BBNJ event 10 years ago, and I also launched an appeal for the ocean to be recognized as a common good of humanity. I realized today that uh, the, law, the, the law of the sea in general, uh, the law on uh, climate change, etc., all the law under UN are cut into pieces uh, since uh, 1992, the Rio summit, uh, and we probably need to try to gather again because we, we have the Biodiversity uh, Convention, we have the Climate Convention, etc. But all those conventions have, have been created in the, in the same time. But probably we should have to try to gather, uh, of course, not the uh, the, the international ocean law, but uh, I think we probably you it's uh, the, the question of scientists uh, for the scientists and the the, the lower you you are. I think we should have to, to try to to connect those uh, framework to to answer what is our question today, and uh, another question about the common heritage of humanity. Because it seems that the common heritage didn't really uh, achieve, uh, help to preserve. We are discussing, nobody spoke about the seabed authority and there is a very big uh, negotiation right now, co totally disconnected with the BBNJ process. So, I would like to know, that's why we launched this appeal for the ocean to be recognized as a common good. It's not a legal one, it's just a moral one. But if we want to preserve the ocean, we need to consider that there is just one ocean totally connected, even with the Convention of the Law, you understand? And that we all are uh, responsible at individual and collective uh, level. Thank you very much. So it's a question. There's a lot of questions in my comments. Thank you. We have another question over there. And with that, then we go to our panelists. Hi. Thank you for the panelists for an incredible session so far. Um, I'm Shalini Iyengar. I'm a lawyer and anthropologist. Um, I'm a, currently a PhD student. Um, I had a quick question on fisheries. And it's actually, I guess, a two-part question. First, um, I've been following some of the negotiations and it looks like there was a significant debate behind the scenes on its inclusion or exclusion in the BBNG and I was wondering if we could hear a little bit more about that process and how that played out. And secondly, I was also curious about um, what the implications of that are going forward. How do you integrate fisheries and climate change and biodiversity because these are highly interconnected uh, when they've been sort of um, excluded, for lack of a better word, from the BBNJ itself. Thank you. Okay, so we have left eight minutes to address <laughs> these questions, and I'm sure this panel is going to be able to do it. We can start with Walter. Okay, thank you. Um, try to, to okay. address uh, some of them in, in a broader manner, just perhaps to, to, to complement the answers provided to the, to the EFSA's question. Um, I agree that it was, it was a pity that it was not a, a included a specific reference. However, uh, in the annex, uh, among the indicative criteria that um, that could be used for the, the determination of for establishment of ABMTs and APAs, uh, there are references to, to rarity, fragility, sensitivity, biological diversity and productivity, uh, ecological connectivity, and importance of ecological processes occurring therein. So you, one can argue that uh, since we have already uh, EPSAs that uh, are uh, aligned or, or those criteria are already included in the EPSAs, you could use uh, not from 
scratch, but you could use some of the apps as, to, as a starting point or even to develop uh, some of them and strengthen and add, or update if, if you could. Um, on the, I don't know if that criteria, by the way, <laughs> is uh, how it is compared to the, to the US, so uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know if colleagues will know. On, on the role of the RFMOs and, and um, ISA, and by, um, we could, could be together because they, there are a number of <coughs> provisions uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the agreement that uh, oblige countries to do permanent consultation. Of course, the whole system is based on um, notification, publication, and information, uh, so that and, and have a cooperation with uh, with the uh, region, global regional sectoral uh, organizations, and that includes, uh, of course, uh, RFMOs, but also includes other organizations. Um, so we there is there is a way for for uh, RFMOs to to have a say in there, but they were. Uh, Attempting <laughs> to to have a, a this part of the decision making uh, or a final one, and that of course was not allowed, and and, and it was uh, important to have a consultation. But at the end of the day, the the, the decision making was always brought back to the to the COP, uh, and and that is perhaps one of the the, the very very uh, debatable uh, or tensions moments that we had even within our delegations with people representing the fisheries. Uh, industrial sector behind <laughs> my seat, uh, pushing for having a reference that excludes fisheries th throughout the text, not only where it finally ended in the in the section of ABNT and PAs, but really, really throughout the text. Um, so there was clearly, at least from some from some countries, a, a, a very strong or voice of making sure that there is no way that the scope. Could, could enter in, into fisheries, which again is something that uh, um, for some countries we have to accept, <laughs> otherwise uh, it would have been possible to, to reach an agreement, a again, even sometimes within our own delegations, not to say with, with other other uh, delegations, but uh, um, at the end of the day, uh, in going and to finalize with the issue of the, of the um, MPA's relationship with that, you all, countries will also have the option to opt out uh, of, of an established, of an established uh, MPA, um, and they're, they're, they could exclude themselves for the measures, of course, that they have to justify and regularly uh, either extend the, opt, uh, the option of opt, opt out or, uh, of course, all of that if they are already part to the, to the agreement. Um, but um, but it, is, it is one of the gaps, I would say. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca. Okay, I'll just uh, touch on a couple of the questions. Um, so, in terms of the process for decision making and, and proposals for marine protected areas, it's actually fairly defined in the agreement, which is helpful. Um, there's a process for at least one or more part state parties to the agreement, so it has to be a, a country, uh, to propose um, a high seas MPA. There's an a series of things that it requires, like a, a, an assessment of the value, biological and, and other values. It requires consultation with traditional people and local communities. Um, there's an assessment of the risks to the area. And then it also requires a management plan to be drafted. Uh, that has to go to the scientific and technical body for review and to stakeholders, I believe. I'm, not sure how specific it is on the stakeholders section. And then they can refine that and then they can take it, like the proponents can refine the proposal and take it to the conference of the parties that will then decide on it. If there is no, there, it's a vote, which was something that's quite um, seen as really positive for the BBNJ Treaty compared to say other arenas like Kamala for the Antarctic marine protected areas, which we've seen one or two countries consistently block the proposals for MPAs. Um, at BBNJ, it just um, requires, I think it's a three quarter majority, but Simi will be able to tell me, or Walter, mm -hmm. if it's two thirds or three quarters for the MPA. MPA is two thirds. Two thirds. Yeah. I'm not a lawyer, and I didn't sit in the rooms during the negotiations and, and, and sweat <laughs> through that, those many, many uh, weeks. But it's 
it's really great that actually it's not at least all 100% of all parties. So I think that just a couple of things to highlight from that which I think are really important, which is that traditional knowledge and local communities um, are really specifically called out and required to participate in those processes. Um, and then I just wanted to also um, reinforce what uh, Walter was saying in terms of the other bodies and it speaks to the uh, IS. International Seabed Authority and their engagement with fisheries and regional fisheries management organisations. The treaty includes it's aimed at protecting all biodiversity and life in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So that does include fish and that does include species that live in the seabed. I mean, that's biodiversity. Um, what it says is that you know, that parties have to not undermine these other international bodies. And certainly from the perspective of the High Seas Alliance and our many members, and um, I know many uh, scientists and, and other people in civil society, they really see that, that the ambition of the biodiversity of, of the BBNJ Treaty as much higher than some of these other existing forums in terms of its aim to protect the biodiversity and that it will have a positive impact and on the environmental management and biodiversity protection regimes that occur in those other bodies. So we will still need to engage with states in those bodies, uh, but we can actually improve the ambition by engaging with them. And many of the sta states that have signed the treaty and will ratify it are active in those other bodies as well. And they have an obligation to not undermine the objectives of the BBNJ treaty. So if you can see what I mean, it's really a kind of upward uh, uh, improving process, in increasing ambition process. I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, if we are allowed to have five more minutes in the room, I'm going to call um, Lisa, Simi, and Nilofer to do a one-minute intervention. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'm, I'm going to address two other points, mostly with a question to the other panelists, but somebody asked about the EIAs and whose EIA process we use. Is it the U.S.? My understanding, and you guys tell me if I'm wrong, is that each country who's proposing the activity uses their own EIA process, but there will be some sort of technical body that would also review it. I, but I'm not 100% sure. And then there was a question about the common heritage in the International Seabed Authority. And um, I think it's really important, important to point out that the BBNJ agreement does include the water and the seafloor. Um, the International Seabed Authority uh, has been given jurisdiction over the seafloor uh, as at, at common heritage of mankind, but mainly f their activities to date have mainly focused on the minerals and protection of the marine environment from minerals mining. And I think there's a lot of controversy and it remains to be seen how they, the International Seabed Authority will interact with the BBNJ agreement as MPAs are developed and uh, EIAs are produced and so on. Uh, quickly, on the EIA process, uh, it's similar to the US process and that of other nations. There are There is a fair amount of specificity in the agreement itself. And so you can take a look at that and then it will be elaborated further um, but it follows the general outlines of EIAs that you're familiar with. Um, I wanted to, yeah, comment on um, the, 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 this question about other bodies, RFMOs, ISA, so on. I think there the critical thing is a large number of states engaged in the negotiation. If they have participation in the International Seabed Authority, the treaty actually asks them, the BBNJ asks them, tells them to represent BBNJ in those other bodies. So if your country or mine is participating in both agreements, they need to represent BBNJ measures, principles, and approaches when they go down to Kingston for the ISA. 
Oh, thank you. So um, very quickly as well. I will, I, of course, the, the question asked by the distinguished member of the EU Parliament concerning the silo, the fragmentation of some of these instruments um, and how perhaps there could be more interlinkage and bringing in science. Um, and this is an issue, uh, partly because, and, well, the Law of the Sea Convention was a pre-climate change convention, yet um, it really does encompass the very clear obligations. Um, and now we're trying to see how we can feed in those obligations um, under that uh, umbrella, and so that we have these advisory opinions. Um, but it is important, I think there has to be some synergistic relationship between them, the Biodiversity Convention. To be quite honest, um, the marine environment was tacked on afterwards. It's all been very terrestrial. Climate change regime as well, it's very terrestrial. Look at Paris Agreement. Uh, Article 5 goes at great length about forests. What about the ocean? <laughs> it's really, you know, so we have to work harder on that and we have to listen to the science. Uh, and very quickly, since 1990, the IPCC has been talking about the ocean um, and the impacts of climate change on the ocean. And each um, report and the scientists progressively have been issued warnings. The convention, we, at, the, at that level, the convention, the UNFCCC system, I call it the whole regime, has been a bit resistant. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, with this, we start uh, to close this session. Uh, thanks, uh, all of you, for have participated, and to the panelists for all the contributions. Uh, I just wanted to close with an invitation uh, to support the High Seas Alliance. Uh, this uh, coalition built by NGOs, uh, academy, civil society, uh, and with the support, of course, of the uh, Ecuadorian delegation. Thank you again for being here, Walter, uh, also Andres. Uh, I, want, I, I want to mention that we have a former Minister of the Environment of Ecuador here, Tarcisio Granizo. Thank you for, for being here as well, showing uh, uh, the country's commitment with the ocean. And uh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, it's, been, it's been a pleasure to moderate this panel today. Thank you.